Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to try and just give you just a, a brief overview of where I think things are generally in transportation policy in 2012, especially with respect to the federal, state, and regional partnerships. And then I'm going to actually try and offer some context for how it is that we got there, and then offer some thoughts in a fairly general way about how we might move forward. Um, so to begin, we've had a century-long partnership between federal and state in particular, and also the regions, that is crumbling right now before our eyes, I think faster than many of under-maintained roads. And um, we're also in an environment where we have increasingly bitter partisan disagreements over the benefits of building, operating, and maintaining transportation infrastructure. And while <clears throat> partisan disagreements are not new, there has a long history of actually bipartisan action on things related to highway and transportation bills and development from uh, really through much of the, of the 20th century, and that these kinds of disagreements are in many ways new. Um, and further, there's disagreements of the appropriate level of government to build, operate, and maintain this infrastructure. A lot of disagreement on who ought to be in charge of this, and this, the sense of this partnership is also weakening as well. Um, third, is we have some waxing philosophical disagreements about the wisdom of promoting mobility. It's what I call the elephant in the room. Uh, these are frequently expressed in modal terms. It goes something like this. Uh, one, one school of thought says, well, we need to promote mobility. We need to promote commerce. We need to encourage the movement of goods. Uh, we need to try and cope with the environmental externalities that might come from that movement of goods, but we need to do it nonetheless. And we need to invest and build and expand our road system. There's a second sort of model, which is that we need to promote alternatives to driving. Uh, we need to focus on sustainability and the lack of sustainability in our transportation system. We need to focus on people movement first and goods movement second. And we need to invest a lot more in public transit. Now, those are simplifications. But in many cases, you'll find that people will be debating some issue, some bill, some project in some legislature somewhere. And behind that debate is really those two philosophical positions at opposition. They're rarely articulated that way, but that's what's going on behind the scenes. So where are we headed? Um, I think the one thing that is certain at this point is that nothing at this point is certain. Um, this is a, a time of a great deal of uncertainty, especially about what the federal role is going to be in shaping transportation finance in the future. Um, and if you can indulge a professor for just a couple of minutes, because I know you guys are actually out there making things happen. Uh, I think that sometimes if we look back a little bit, it can help us have some ideas about how we're headed forward. So where were we a century ago? Well, we didn't have an SUV driving on this road, but we did have a severe problem with the quality of the road system. Um, and we had a system of disconnected roads. We, didn't have, we had a lack of hierarchy. We actually had many more miles of roadways than we have today. Uh, every parcel had a road uh, built up to it. We had no system for being able to upgrade those roads because counties and states were under enormous pressure to try and get a road to everyone's property. And that to improve any one road was, was uh, turning their back on anyone else. And so there was a fight to try and spread limited money around as much as possible. There was a federal role with respect to postal roads, but it was relatively minor. Uh, the states were focused primarily on rural roads. They were pretty much leaving the cities to themselves. Uh, and they were struggling in many cases around the nation with a s substantially growing bonded indebtedness. Um, and at the time, there was a lot of de debate about this because not everybody drove and not everybody was making use of the road system. The idea that we're taking on all of this debt uh, for a few beneficiaries created real claims and, and qualms about equity. And so there wasn't really a good system for figuring out what to do. Toll roads were impractical because many of the roads had much too little volume. Couldn't, couldn't survive under that financial model. And they were struggling with how to go about trying to maintain the system. In many cases, here in California, we, had, uh, we were still paying bonds on roads that had been constructed and then were needing to be reconstructed uh, before their, the, the life of the bond uh, had been retired. And so it was creating serious problems. In the cities, there were no real regions at that point. Uh, property taxes were used for streets. And during the Great Depression, that fell apart. And public transit at this time was almost exclusively privately owned and operated. And the role of government was to regulate uh, pu private, uh, public transit and not to try and uh, develop it in any way. Um, and the question of who should build, maintain, and pay for needed road upgrades was very much up in the air. And it really was sorted out during the 20s and the 30s. So 
what I'm going to do is just give you a thumbnail sketch of what I think, and this is just helps you think about where we are now and how we got here, uh, of really four eras I would describe in kind of the federal state finance uh, uh, partnership. There's one I'd call establishing roles of commitments, where we were sort of deciding who would be responsible for what and who would pay for what. Then we went into a mode of mass production of highways. Then what I describe as sort of fiscal retrench retrenchment and a rise of multimodalism. And then finally, an era of ad hoc uh, projects and finance, which we still seem to be in. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so first, with establishing roles and commitments, this is from about 1920 to 1945, we established a model of state-federal partnership. That had not really existed before. And that model was built on a matching logic. If you, states, do this thing, we will give you money, but you have to match it. You don't have to do it, but if you want to get the money, it has to be matched in some ways. And in some ways, the states were very happy to have that. They had pressure from everyone. They wanted to upgrade a few highways, but politically it was impossible. The federal government could come in and say, you have a federal aid urban system. It's limited to this many miles in your state. We don't care where it is, but you cannot go an inch over that many miles. So they'd come up with their best plan, and then they'd say, they could say to people who complained, look, there's nothing we can do about it. They, they've got a gun to our head. We're, we're stuck. We can only do this. And in fact, it helped us to start to develop a hierarchical road system. In other words, the state part, the federal partnership was helping states do the things they'd always wanted to do, but found politically impossible to do. Uh, we had generally abandoned bond finance, and there were a few reasons for that. One of it is, is that it was very clear that the people who were most directly benefiting from the road system were people who either owned property adjacent to the roads and the people who were using the roads. And it wasn't seen as a generalized public benefit. So in cities, we used property taxes to pay for the, the people who benefited adjacent to those, those highways. And we developed this really cool thing that started in England and then went to Oregon and then spread and went viral, which was the motor fuel tax. It's actually levied way upstream on just a few um, <coughs> distributors. It had very low problems with, uh, with, with graft. It was not levied at the pump like a sales tax. They could take it from the distributors, and they could dedicate it into funds for transportation, which made it seem, and it was portrayed at the time, as a user fee. We have these transportation accounts. We take this money from the, from the fuel. We put it into those accounts, and then we have political fights about how to spend that money, but it's clear as to where it's coming from. If driving goes up, the money goes up, and we have more money to pay for it. And that logic lasted for almost 100 years. We established this system of user finance based on the motor fuel tax that I just mentioned. And this really started at the state level and moved to the federal government. And we established federal f uh, funds to motivate st highways to, uh, states to invest in highways, as I mentioned. OK, then after the Second World War, we sort of had these institutions in place. We had broad support for increased taxes and fees tied to highway development, if you can imagine such a thing. Um, <clears throat> the transition taxes and fees increased at regular intervals from about 1945 to about 1960. Almost every two years, the federal states were constantly increasing the amount um, uh, levied on vehicles for driving. And this allowed them to keep pace with increasing costs. This user fee logic was codified by moving almost all of the transportation funds off budget into trust funds. And I don't know, here in California, we have the state highway accounts. Uh, at the federal uh, level, there were accounts, and most other states established these as well. At this time, there were wholesale bankruptcies of private urban transit systems for reasons that I lecture for many hours on my students as to what was the, behind that. But this meant that there was a gradual shift towards public ownership and subsidy of, of transit systems. Now, in about 1970, <coughs> we have a move toward what I'd call fiscal retrenchment and a rise to, to multimodalism. There was unraveling support for the freeway program. As, free, as freeways started to be cut through cities, we started to build coalitions in opposition to that. Users loved them, but the displacement that was involved in cities was not so popular. Highway finance began to sunset with no increases in motor fuels taxes. Motor fuels taxes, for the most part, and some of your states may be exceptions, are levied on a cents per gallon. And because of that, if there is inflation or there's increasing fuel efficiency, you must increase that levy to actually keep pace. Politically, that's a nightmare. You don't ever want an instrument that requires you to go through the politically symbolic act of raising the levy in order to keep in the same place. And unfortunately, that's a quality that has killed the, the motor fuel tax. If it, were, if it were indexed in some other way, and there have been efforts to index it, but they have been politically difficult rows to hoe. 
Um, and because of that, if you don't do anything, it's the opposite of the income tax. If you don't do anything to a, a motor fuels tax, it starts to erode over time. Now, there was a shift in legislative attention from highways to public transit, and that has continued to be very important in my region of Los Angeles. About 55% of all the surface transportation expenditures over the next 30 years are going to be on public transit. In the Bay Area, it's about 80%. Uh, and the longstanding bipartisan support for transportation is a, oh, you know what? <laughs> doing my, sorry, I've got to remember, I've got two things going on here. Um, I, just imagine, it's almost like you're reliving all of this. <laughs> but there we go. Uh, Long-standing bipartisan support for transportation investment as a tool of economic development started to erode, and it shifts to more partisan rifts over tax increases. Uh, Republicans have never liked redistributive programs. Uh, but there was a long coalition of what may be called sort of a Chamber of Commerce wing of the Republican Party that was always more supportive of levies that had clear investments in infrastructure to promote economic development. And that has sort of gone by the wayside, at least for right now. And so in a sense, we have arguments more about should there be taxation at all, and it operates at many levels of government. Okay, so this, this era of projects and finance. Um, First, we've had an unraveling of this long-standing commitment to user fees dedicated to transportation. Uh, there's been an unwillingness to increase user fees, um, so the state role of transportation has started to decline relative to metropolitan planning organizations in many states. So because the relative proportion of, of money that states is putting in is going down, uh, cities and regions have started to wax in terms of their role. Um, this is especially the case in the more metropolitan states. Uh, we started to return to bonds and general taxes from transportation, which we abandoned about 80 or 90 years ago as inefficient and inequitable. And the reason that the public officials will give is ugh, we can't do anything else. And what we can do is we can find the smallest possible levy and put it over the largest number of transactions, that that's what wins. Because you do focus groups and you ask people, and this happens uh, all the time, would you rather have a nickel increase in the gas tax or would you rather pay a penny more in the sales tax? And by well, depending on the poll, but about 80 to 85 percent of the people say, I'd rather have a penny on the, sales, on the sales tax. When asked why, they say, well, because a penny is so much less than a nickel. If there's a follow-up question that says, do you realize that the average household will pay about twice as much in a given year on a one cent sales tax than they would on a nickel increase in the gas tax? And then you re-ask the question, about 85 cent percent say they would prefer the gas tax. Unfortunately, you cannot pose that question before people enter the, the, uh, poll, the toll, uh, booth, the voting booth, and because of that, we have this issue of really small levies. I've often said is if we actually did move to the metric system as they promised I would when I was in elementary school back in the 1960s, we'd be talking about a one penny per liter increase, which would be much easier to do politically than a nickel per gallon. So, uh, and we've had a rise of project earmarking, uh, which has a sign of sort of a, a mission drift, uh, but it's turned out to be very politically important in some ways. So, these waxing roles of states and especially cities and reasoned, uh, regions vis-a-vis -vis the feds in addressing surface transportation problems in 2012 starts to look eerily similar to what was going on in 1912. The feds were there, but their role isn't as central as it was 50 years ago. So beyond this logic of public finance and crisis, I think that uh, what we find is a lot of debates over transportation taxes are increasingly abstract. They, they aren't really about what do we do with this. It's about is taxation a good idea or a bad idea. This makes it very difficult to link taxes and prices to solving particular problems. And it helps to explain why local sales taxes linked to very specific projects have proven relatively popular. So, okay, the next is I think there's no longer any consensus, and I, maybe in your states it's different, on the benefits of education. This is what I call the education versus heroin problem. This is, is, is transportation like education or is it like heroin? Is it kind of feel good but it's really not good for you at all? Uh, or is it actually good for you in the long run? This is what, where we stand today about vehicle miles of travel. Are we trying to discourage it or encourage it? And there's no agreement. So if it's education, we need funding to, uh, to improve the road system and traffic flows. If it's heroin, taxes and fees are needed to discourage travel. We need to punish bad modes and we need to subsidize good modes. Uh, third is that federal and many state programs are disintegrating before our eyes. Uh, this marriage of convenience among modal interests is starting to break down. It used to be we had sort of a detente among the various modal interests. 
And we're trending away from big programs and toward local projects, even if they're federally funded. And because of that, the logic of a larger program gets lost. It really becomes more and more about a local project and getting it funded. Um, fourth is that there's a widespread belief in the inelasticity of travel demand. Now that sounds kind of academic. What do I mean is that it turns out that what people pay for transportation has an effect on their travel behavior. Fuel prices go up. People start to move toward more fuel efficient vehicles. They might do a little more carpooling. It isn't dramatic, but it does have an effect. Fuel prices go down, they buy bigger cars, and they make adjustments accordingly. Uh, supporters and opponents of taxes and fees, in other words, tend to view them as punitive. If we raise the tax, we're either good, we're telling those people they should be driving less, or bad, we're telling those good people they should be driving less. Either case, it's a bad thing to do, and they can't change their behavior anyway. And the, uh, the next thing is what I've called the ribbon cutting problem. And uh, if I can figure out how to get my students to cut a ribbon into better headways or better uh, uh, incident management, we'd be in great shape. The problem is, is that big capital projects are what get you in the news. Uh, we just opened the expo line in Los Angeles. All the reporters were calling and asking me about our, our newest rail line. And I said, well, you know, we've done these great things with uh, with real-time information at transit stops, and we've done a better thing with, with organized uh, signal timing. We put in this new, uh, we're experimenting with this new high occupancy toll system, and there, I can hear them, oh. uh, but can you cut a rub ribbon in front of any of those things? We have, a, we have a banner. So there's this orientation over time toward big capital projects, and that means that we're running into a certain kind of financial crisis, and that's an operating and maintenance crisis. You talk to people, they say, it's a campaign, but I can get money for that big project. I can't get money to operate or maintain it. There's no real support for that. Um, and the ultimate objectives of transportation systems, I think, are poorly understood and poorly articulated. The links to economic productivity and the quality of life are not systematically analyzed. In many cases, agencies don't really want people to do it. Uh, public officials, um, present company excluded, of course, often confuse costs and benefits. If we, if we tax, take tax money and we spend money building a project, that's economic benefit. That's actually a cost. The benefits come from the ability of that project to make the transportation system work better. And when they are, they're usually not part of the decision-making process. If you are really looking at an analysis of what's going to be the economic benefit of a project, it's usually presented by economists in a way that's so arcane that no, no normal person can make sense of it. So what's a state to do? How am I in time? I can wrap up. I'm okay? About five more minutes? Is that okay? Okay. I think that there's really uh, five options. There should be four, but of course there's always the option of, of doing nothing. So that's, that's the fifth option. Let me just go through, oh, shoot, there we go. Let me go through these pretty quickly. Uh, one is we can raise fuel taxes again. Now, what are the pros and cons? Fuel taxes are an established revenue raising method. Their dire needs can push uh, pol in political action when maybe there's not a willingness. Uh, an increase is very simple administratively. What are some of the cons? Voters resent fuel taxes. The political situation is unfavorable to an increase, and fuel taxes tend to drop as fuel efficiency increases. Okay, uh, raising the fuel tax will increase uh, fuel economy, and it will have that effect over time. Once enacted, it could be implemented overnight. Uh, the need for frequent hikes can be eliminated through indexing, and fuel taxes are fair because the more you drive, the more you pay. The cons are is that higher taxes doesn't reduce demand a lot. If indexed, fuel taxes are uh, one-time fixes if they're not indexed, and even indexing can be politically difficult to maintain, and fuel taxes are seen by people as unfair. So depending on your, your situation, you see it as fair or unfair. You can increase subsidies, and these are especially what we call lots or local option sales taxes. And more and more states and regions are doing this. Um, <clears throat> lots are fairly popular, and they've, they've proven to be very effective ge re revenue generating devices. Uh, they're imposed by direct democracy, so it feels good on that front, and they tend to keep the revenue at home. The problem is that lots are an unstable funding source depending on economic conditions. Uh, they're relatively inflexible. Usually voters approve a, a slate of projects, and if circumstances change, you're often bound by that, that slate. And um, the problem as well is they keep the revenue at home, so if you have to move money around, for, uh, you can't do that. Uh, lots tend to uh, fund program that voters like. Uh, they're not that difficult to administer because most systems uh, have sales taxes. 
They're dedicated to transportation and they raise revenues quickly. The cons are the most popular programs may not be the best one. My colleague calls this sort of the Christmas tree approach. Let's see, we need a project for the Northeast area. Uh, let's stick that one in. Um, lots are regressive. That is, is that people's income uh, goes down, the share they pay in sales tax goes up. Uh, they tie the hands of planners and policymakers because they always, always come with a fixed program. And they're unconnected to transportation system use. So the idea that you use more or less of the transportation system is unrelated to that. So then there's bond finance. Uh, and Sean asked me to talk about that. Bond finance is a finance tactic. It's not a revenue source. Okay? That's a really important thing to understand, and sometimes that gets lost in these debates. Bonds can make solid financial sense. It's a very much of a green eye shade thing. If you have a project that is a very big project with a long stream of benefits, it makes sense to spread out the payments for that over a long period of time as well. Uh, bonds accelerate the, the construction of needed projects. Uh, if building sooner might be worthwhile. Uh, the cons are there's no such thing as a free lunch, uh, although voters are told you won't have to increase taxes to pay for it. Bonds do not allow us to build more, they allow us to build more quickly. And bonds tend to have a high price tag when, you, when, uh, when you're downstream and you're devoting a very large share of your revenue into, into debt service. Uh, bonds are politically viable. They can literally save lives if you can get needed, say, bridge replacements in place. Um, and it's only fair that uh, payment should be paid in the future if the beneficiaries are in the future. The cons are, is this politically expedient past may not be the best one, and ex ex um, excessive bond issues can exhaust a state's borrowing capacity. Uh, bond issues guarantee revenues will be spent on transportation, which many find to be good. They make sense when expenditures are lumpy, but in a big state like California, our expenditures tend not to be so lumpy. Um, the markets may demand a very high risk premium. Oops, here. Uh, um, bonds may relax fiscal discipline, and I see all sorts of evidence of that here in California. And bonds do not make sense when the expenditures are constant from year to year, which is often the case at a, at a federal level na at nationwide. OK, and then finally, tolls and other direct user fees. Uh, fees are, are an important uh, uh, a principle in the idea is that the more you use, the more you pay. Uh, privacy concerns about being able to track for fees has, have been addressed in many places. Uh, the user fees increase effective capacity, and, and because the fee is adjusted to what you're consuming, it tends to modulate demand in a way that makes us can use facilities more effectively. The, the cons are that the fees might invade privacy. Uh, they don't necessarily dedicate funds for transportation, and the demand for travel may not always not be easy to ama manage. Now, even when small changes in driving can make a big difference. So a lot of people don't realize that, is that when you have a lot of congestion out there, people think, oh my gosh, we'd have to get rid of three quarters of the cars to get this. It's usually a very, very small incremental change can have a huge effect on behavior. It's highly nonlinear. Uh, and so tolling of certain kinds, like we have here at SR91, uh, can ha and down here at uh, I-15, we have these projects that can have a big effect on congestion. User fees tend to be fair because they, you pay for what you get. The toll burden uh, will actually fall most heavily on the wealthy in absolute terms. Um, um, the cons are that the user fees are an unfamiliar form of finance and people uh, don't like them. Uh, and the tolling is still regressive as it is with sales taxes. And, and, uh. So finally, uh, the, they may be regressive, but they're, uh, so are all of our other current forms of finance. Uh, even if tolls are regressive, user fees can benefit the poor as well because it tends to be um, uh, linked. If a poor person is using the road, they're benefiting from it. It's not a general tax. And sometimes the value of time is extremely high for all. So what it allows you to do is, in a sense, buy your way out of congestion if you need to. And we find that even low-income people are willing to do that from time to time. Now, just because other finance methods are unfair doesn't mean we can say, well, tolls are okay as a result. And user fees are almost always the most di politically difficult to uh, enact. So what's the best path forward? Uh, doing nothing may be the worst option of all. And I'd say right now, if you wanted me to describe exactly where we are with federal and state finance, I think this is the path we're following, which is to, to, to do nothing. So. Okay, uh, thank you very much. This is drawn from a report I recently did for the state of California on sort of options for transportation finance in the state. Thank you very much.